Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you've followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Welcome to our podcast, dear listeners. I'm Anne, your host. And today we have a really thought-provoking topic to delve into, suicide. And I'm privileged to have Lisa Sugarman as our guest. And Lisa is an incredible parenting author, a syndicated columnist, and a survivor herself of suicide loss. Lisa is also a crisis counselor with the Trevor Project. Now, we recognized that suicide, unfortunately, is a tragic occurrence that can leave us feeling bewildered and grappling for the answers. That question, why, seems almost impossible to comprehend and leaves families with lasting trauma and torment. In their grief, families may even harbor a sense of responsibility, believing that they could have prevented it somehow. To shed some light on this distressing subject and gain, as I mentioned, a deeper understanding of the increasing rates of suicide, I now turn to our esteemed guest, Lisa. Lisa. Welcome, Lisa. I'm so grateful that you're with us today because it is indeed um, a crisis that you are noticing, aren't you, from your very involvement. Can you share what the Trevor Project is? I can, sure. Thank you, Anne. First of all, for having me on, uh, you and I had such a lovely conversation the last time we talked, and I've been so excited to get back to that conversation. So I I have been a Trevor Project crisis counselor now for uh, over a year on their crisis lifeline, which many people probably know is is similar to the old fashioned, you pick up the telephone and you you dial uh, you dial an 800 number and you reach a crisis counselor. That is what I do. Um, that's one of a couple of different things that the Trevor Project offers. They also offer a texting service as well. If someone doesn't feel like they can or want to talk to someone voice to voice, they can always text someone as well. But what what I do is work on a lifeline that uh, really offers support services, intervention um, crisis de-escalation for a target audience of LGBTQ youth in crisis ages 13 to 24. Uh, while that's our, our primary demographic, we will never, ever turn anyone away regardless of whether or not they're in the LGBTQ community or whether they're outside of our age demographic. We, we're there to help anyone at any point uh, with any kind of crisis that they may be dealing with, whether it's uh, a, a crisis of coming out, which we we see and hear so much of mm -hmm. within the LGBTQ community, or it, it may be a suicidal ideation or a homicidal ideation. It could be food insecurity. It could be abuse. It could be an issue with, with a partner. There are so many different reasons why someone may be in crisis. So we, we kind of see and hear all of it mm -hmm. on the lifeline. And my job really as a counselor is really just to give agency to the caller who's calling in distress and, and really just have a, an unbiased and non-judgmental voice that they can mm -hmm. hear and um, place where they can, where they can kind of offload what's on their mind and in their heart space and, and, um, hopefully provide them with some support and some resources that they need. Hey, okay, wow. 
And as I mentioned, it's becoming more important that there be such services such as yours, because it seems that just the climate that we're living in is creating a real stressor amongst our teens, because mm -hmm. they are teens, aren't they, that age demographic that you mm -hmm. that you service? Yeah, many of them are. I, I mean, we we start offering services to to teenagers starting at the age of thirteen because that's such a critical developmental point in in a young person's life. So many influences, so many opportunities, so many challenges. They're really just coming into their own personality wise at that time or beginning to and. It's a tough, tough road. Anyone who's either had a teenager or any of us who remember what those years were like remembers that there are some really, really tough things that happen during that period of your time uh, with, with relationships, with regard to our bodies developing, our minds developing, our social emotional capacity. It's, 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 it's a lot. And we we often hear from kids who are just they're just they're struggling they're struggling to fit in they're struggling to be who they are they're struggling to come out they're struggling with in in a lot of cases uh, home life that may be very challenging mm -hmm. so we we try to just hold space hold space for them hold space for anyone who is experiencing any type of a mental health crisis because what really what what someone who's calling needs more than anything is to be validated. They just need whatever's going on in their own world to be acknowledged and, and seen and validated in as much as we can. And so that's what we try to do. Yeah. And it sounds like you create um, a really safe environment for them to be able to share what is near and dear to their hearts because well, gosh, yes. Remember those teenage years, the raging hormones, mm. wanting to fit in with the cool kids and not being quite cool enough because you don't wear the right clothes. I mean, those those yeah. were some of the things going on in my day, but now I think it's even worse, isn't it, with the comparisons with all the social media mm -hmm. and things like this adding to their stresses. So do they really have good friends? Do they have a support network with all this going on? Um, it's hard to say. You yeah, hear from them. Yeah, it is. It is hard to say, and it's it's difficult. I mean, you you mentioned one kind of piece of the equation that comes up all the time, and it's this social media influence. It's yeah. it's this false perception in a lot of ways that you're part of something bigger because you're connected to something virtually, but mm -hmm. in reality, maybe they're not. Um, and, and that can be really disconcerting for kids who, you know, who are getting bombarded every day with, with influences and with, you know, FOMO, fear of missing mm -hmm. out on every little thing, because now everything that we do, every move that we make, you know, kids and adults alike, yeah. everything is recorded, everything is documented, everything is shared. And if you're not in that picture with that group doing that thing, there's a lot that comes up for these teens who who feel like, well, why, why wasn't I included? Why wasn't I invited? Why can't I be part of your circle? And so I, I think, you know, social media in, in one way, it allows us to, to, share information that's helpful, but it allows us to also be bombarded with information that's not helpful. So it's very much a, you know, a double-edged sword. And especially as you mentioned their identities, they're attempting to find out who they are and where, yeah, and not to be able to see yourself in others and where you fit in has got to, I guess, push those stress levels totally through the roof as well. Mm. Are you finding it's 
I think you mentioned that these children can come from dysfunctional families or they lack the support at home, or is it the fact that they don't feel comfortable sharing with a parent? Is that? You know, it's honestly a mixture, Anne. It's a mixture of of all of those things. Um, I mean, you can you can have a, a a supportive home life to a point where you're not you don't have food insecurity. You aren't sharing a bedroom with several family members where you don't have to worry that the heat is going off. I mean, you know, there are are so many different kinds of environments. You could be in a in a seemingly stable family where there's food on the table and and somewhat you know, some sort of support, regular support, but you can also you can also still have parents who aren't approachable. You can still have parents who are very hands off. You can have you could have a family dynamic where people are still fending for themselves. So, I mean, and you could also, you can, you can have supportive environments in the most stressful places and you can have chaos in places where you wouldn't think it should exist because all the pieces seem to be in place. The optics look like everything is ideal. So it's, it's hard to say, but it comes from, it comes from everywhere. Um, I think a lot of, Kids nowadays are just seeing how certain segments of the population are being treated. They're, I mean, look no further than, for instance, the trans community and mm-hmm. how under fire this poor community is. You know, they're marginalized as it is and and they're, you know, they're being alienated. So it's no wonder that a child who may think that they're trans is hesitant to come out because they're seeing the response from the rest of the world. And, you know, if you, if you don't feel completely comfortable and safe in your own home environment, you're going to question whether or not you can actually, can actually come out with that kind of information. Information, Yeah. Because you're sort of seeing it. It may not necessarily be, as you say, in the home, but it's in, it's in and around the environment, the culture, their communities. Mm. And how safe do they feel? Right. What an incredible position. And it has to be very rewarding when you pick up that phone and you're able to talk somebody down who it's, may be considering suicide. It's it's probably one of the things I'm most grateful for at this point in my life. I mean, as I said, I've been doing this now for over a year, so I've I've been on many, many phone calls where people have wanted to end their life. And to be in a situation where you can make an, enough of an impact on someone's either trauma or someone's mental illness or their stress level to bring them back to a point of perspective where you can de-escalate them to a point where they no longer feel like their only option is to take their life. Mm -hmm. That's a hugely powerful position to be in. It's a gift is, is what it really is in my opinion. So I'm very grateful every time I pick up the phone. Yeah. To be able to, to have that conversation and know that you made a difference Mm -hmm. in that person's life. Mm -hmm. Now, for any parent who may be listening who has a trans child or uh, they're aware of the LGBTQ community, what are some of the signs that a parent could potentially, you know, have a little bit of an awareness around their teen? I mean, it's hard enough being a parent of a teen but what Mm. might be some of the things that we could create an awareness for these parents are you talking about in terms of signs that things aren't right yeah what might yeah what might be some of the the signs because I know it's those are the things that parents if it does happen Mm -hmm. 
that's the thing they're going to grapple onto and makes the the whole death worse, isn't it? Is yes. I could have, I should have. Right, right, right. So I think with with anyone and, and teens are certainly no exception and and those in the trans community are no exception either. I think with anyone who is is in that space of conflict, that having that internal conflict and who is experiencing stress and or depression or anxiety on that level, there you're going to see changes in their behavior. They may not be as communicative. If all of a sudden you have a child who you've always been able to have a decent communication relationship with, all of a sudden they're not they're not engaging in the way that they usually do. That's a sign. That's something that might signal that something is wrong. If they're, of course, of course most teens spend most of their life in their bedroom. So this one is a little bit harder to, to, to exactly. differentiate. But, you know, if they're all of a sudden really spending an awful lot of time alone, what seems to be like a disproportionate amount of time alone and doesn't want to interact, if you notice that maybe they're, they're, if they're giving things away, if they're, oh. if they're parting with things, if your child, for instance, if your child plays the guitar and all of a sudden they are losing interest in what used to be a passion for them and they are, are giving possessions away that may be very important to them or may have been very important to them, that's also a telltale sign that someone is kind of purging themselves of the things that that mattered to them in an effort to to make some kind of an exit. So, um, you know, and, and obviously too, there are just those those I think more obvious signs and signals. Like if if they're picking fights all the time, if they're arguing, if if um, if you notice that their stress and aggravation level is at a different point than it usually is. Um, all, of, all of those things can signal that that something is not right under the surface. And, and I think that when we're keeping our eyes open and when we're looking for these kinds of signs, one of the other things that we can always be doing, whether we see signs or not as a parent, is to ask our kids, what do you need? What's going on with, with you? What's happening? What's going on in your head? We spend an awful lot of time talking to our kids, which is, of course, what we're supposed to do. We're parents. Yes. But we don't often make the same amount of space for our kids to talk to us. Mm. And that's and and that's something we, we don't really think about it because, or at least I know I didn't as much when I was parenting younger kids. You're the one who, of course, is... The, you know, you're, you're the rule maker and you're the disciplinarian and you're the source of information and you're the one creating boundaries. So we kind of always have to be, we feel like we always have to be kind of in that persona all the time. But one of the most valuable things that we can ever do is really just shut up and listen to our kids and ask them what's going on. Just ask them what's going on. Mm. Would you advocate for a parent if they what? Well, because there's a certain amount of alarm bells that can go off. I know mm -hmm. for me, I could always tell when there was something off. And mm -hmm. I used to say it was uh, mom's magic eye at the back of my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a sense, isn't there? Would you advocate that the parent actually just come out and ask the child? Ask them if they're suicidal? Yeah. If they Absolutely. Would... Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and this is also something that we're trained on as crisis counselors to be very, very direct with that question in particular, the way that we ask, the language that we use. There's, there's a real misconception out there in the world that people believe that if you were to be direct and ask someone whose mental health you were questioning, are, are you okay? Are you thinking of harming yourself, that if you ask directly and say, are you thinking of killing yourself? 
it's such a startling thing to ask Isn't that people, ask? yeah, that, that people often think, well, I can't possibly ask that in that way using that language because that's going to somehow insert an idea into their head. That's going to, if they already have that in mind, that's going to push them closer to making that decision. And the, the reality is nothing could be further from the truth. The reality is that by being direct, by asking, there have been so many studies that have been done about the effectiveness of being That's direct. Mm -hmm. And that is what someone needs to hear. And if anything, what that actually does is reduce the, the risk factor associated with that person right. trying to harm themselves or take their life because they're being, they're being validated. You see that they're in pain. You're acknowledging that they're in oh, pain right. and that they need help. So by asking if that's what they're contemplating, it validates it in a very, very different way. So anybody who might be listening to this, especially a parent who's questioning what their teen is feeling, if you're worried that they're feeling they're feeling suicidal, address it head on. Talk to them openly, honestly, and non-judgmentally. That's that's the key. That's the kind of the the X factor in having that conversation is just be kind and be non-judgmental so they know they're safe. And just the very fact that they are hearing these words, they probably feel that for the first time there's, they have an ally. Mm -hmm. As you said, that they're being validated. Somebody understands mm -hmm. what it is they're going through. And yeah, it's so, so important to leave our judgments behind. I mean, for those of us who grew up in 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, <laughs> when we used the word committed suicide, it mm. was against the law, wasn't it? So there is still that stigma, which I hope we will eventually it'll be erased from our memories and our vocabulary. But I think that is still there, is it not? It It is. And it's actually something that I talk quite a bit about. Um, I, I, I talk about it when I'm on, I have a YouTube channel. I've been creating a lot of content for my Suicide Survivor series. It's a video series. And that was one of the first videos that I actually filmed, which was really just kind of a 90 second explanation of why we need to change our language, oh, why we need to reform our thinking. Because like you said, at one point in time, it may have been true that that taking your life was, was a crime, was perceived as a crime mm -hmm. or perceived as a sin. When you say the word committed, there's a very specific connotation associated with that word and, and sin comes to mind and crime comes to mind and something illegal or immoral comes to mind. And it creates a perception that what this person either intended to do or did do was criminal. And that's not the case. It's no. absolutely not the case. No, and, and language really matters more now than it ever has. Oh, there's more awareness around it, isn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. And I think if we are able to be careful with our language, but also to, my train went without me. <laughs> that happens to me all the time. Hey, uh, that will be an edit. Oh, <laughs> it, was go it was going to be so important. Take a minute. Take a minute. Think about it. it happens to me at least 50 times a day. <laughs> Thank you. I thought it was the age bracket. Um, no. I love that you have created a, a YouTube channel and that is what you, uh, you're sharing the why it's not a good idea. You're giving mm. us languaging. And I think we have come so far that we now recognize that this person had to have been in so much pain that 
that was their only way out. They mm. couldn't conceive of how not to feel this way day in and day out. Mm -hmm. I cannot even begin to understand what that would even feel like to be so lost in that. It's a feeling of desperation. It's a feeling that nothing else matters except for the pain that they're in 24 hours a day, whenever they're, whenever they're, awake and conscious and capable of thought. They are deep, dark, heavy, impossible thoughts to live with. And it's, it's interesting that we're having this conversation because I did record a video this afternoon speaking about this in particular, talking about how, you know, the, the person who's taken their life, if they've if they've gotten that far and they've actually taken their life, isn't trying to escape us. They're not trying to leave us. They're not thinking about that. They're thinking about one thing and one thing only. And that's just to make the pain that they're in stop because that pain permeates everything. When you're talking about the pain of mental illness mm -hmm. or that, that the depth of someone's depression and anxiety, that's a place where nothing else but that pain exists. It's sort of and it, all consuming. It is. It, yeah. it is. And it, it transcends everything. And granted, there are a lot of people out there. My father was one of them who have the very unique ability to compartmentalize that pain and, and keep it out of the mainstream, keep it away from the people who love them. And then there are those who can't, those who don't have that capacity to keep it hidden. So those people are easier, unfortunately, they're, they're easier to spot and they're in some cases a lot easier to help. It's the people who have gotten very good at hiding how they feel. Mm. Those are the ones, those are the ones that, that we have to check in on. Those are the ones that we, we have to prioritize uh, keeping them on our radar because it's too easy for them to to slip off the radar and and not to be helped at all. Mm -hmm. So when you say they're good at compartmentalizing, it would be all too easy to sort of put it down to, well, that's the way he always is. That's the way she always acts. Mm -hmm. uh, and that be a familiar and be okay with it. Would they share? If confronted? I think it depends on the person. It, it really it? depends yeah. on the person. And I think it depends on who's asking. Okay. I, I think, I think obviously someone is way more likely to be transparent and to let you know exactly what's going on when they don't feel like they're being judged, when mm. they feel safe and supported. I think there's always a better likelihood of someone being honest and open. But, you know, you got to remember too, a lot of people, we're a very connected world. It's, it, it's unlikely that anyone in this world could think about what would happen if, if they confessed their suicidal thoughts it's it's impossible to believe that everyone doesn't think they'd immediately be institutionalized. I mean, people think mm -hmm. that that's what happens if you yes. if you're very open and honest that you're you're going to be in a padded room or mm -hmm. someone's going to come you know police is going to come knocking down your door and do an intervention and you know obviously in certain situations you know I mean we're lifeline counselors not not every call is, you know, easy to resolve. Not every crisis is easy to deescalate. And, and there are times when we have to do both voluntary and involuntary interventions if someone's life is at imminent risk and, and everything else that we know we need to try has been exhausted, of course, then, you know, we obviously call for support. But again, that doesn't mean that someone's going to immediately be put in a straitjacket and, and put in a padded room. You know, I mean... And I think that, that frightens a lot of people because 
that if they were to yes. open up and have this conversation with a mm -hmm. spouse or a good friend, mm -hmm. that that might be the reality. Yeah, I think a lot of people are terrified of that. And I, th I also think, and I recorded, again, I recorded another video um, earlier this week about how I think people misinterpret what a lifeline is for. People think, well, I can, I, I have to be, I have to be fully suicidal to be calling a lifeline. That's not true. People can just need to talk. People can just need space help. People can just need resources or support or a place to vent. We're there. If you're in crisis, crisis is very subjective. What might be paralyzing for you may certainly not be for somebody else. But if you're in crisis, period, you can call a crisis hotline, whether it be the 988 hotline, whether it be uh, texting the crisis text line, or whether it be calling someone like uh, like me at the Trevor Project Lifeline. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we need to get out into the world. Not only that these resources exist, but who are they who are they supposed to be helping? Mm -hmm. Who is supposed to be utilizing those? Yeah. So that's that's one of the things that I'm out here doing is is kind of busting myths and saying, if you're having uh, food insecurity and you're stressed about it, call a lifeline. Yeah. If you're worried about coming out as transgender, call the lifeline uh, and everything well, in between. What a beautiful conversation. I'm glad we're having it because, yes, again, I would imagine a lot of people feel that, well, I'm not suicidal or it's not that bad. But regardless, just call because you mm. never know. Exactly. Just talking, just talking to somebody, how supportive that can actually feel. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go to your, I said you were a survivor of suicide. I believe I that's how you word it. Mm -hmm. I am actually, um, I am a three-time survivor of suicide loss in in my lifetime uh the first was not my father the first was my uh cousin who lived up the street from us who took his own life he was 18 and i was nine at the time it was a year before my father passed away so i i was all too acquainted with suicide at a very very young age and it was a year after we lost my cousin that my father passed away the only the only unique part of that story is that I was unaware that my father had taken his life until I was 45 years old. So I lost him when I was 10. The story that I was told was that he had had a massive heart attack and he was, he was a smoker. So it, it wasn't like it was too far fetched, mm -hmm. but it was nothing that I would ever have questioned. And like I said, because my father was so good at keeping his mental illness and whatever depression he was dealing with hidden, mm -hmm. no one had any idea whatsoever that he was struggling and needed help. And then uh, only about two and a half years ago, we lost one of our closest childhood friends to suicide. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the same, but different for each one of those. So I was 10 years old when I learned that my father had died of what I was told was a massive heart attack. Mm -hmm. That was the narrative that I had. I had no reason to ever question that. And that was the narrative that I carried with me for the next 35 years of my life until I was 45. When I discovered very accidentally, just through a conversation with a family member, that my father apparently had had some issues with depression. I was unaware of them. So I asked my mother about it. And even though I had then learned that there were some issues with depression, it never, it never caused a chain reaction. It never caused me to think that, that the story of his death was untrue or that he had been dealing with anything else. It never, depression seemed like a very isolated thing to me. I didn't think it extended beyond that. But mm -hmm. in that conversation with my mother, when I asked about his depression and she acknowledged it and said, yes, 
before I even knew what I was asking, I asked her if he had taken his life. I, to this day, I still firmly believe my father sent a hand down that day and tapped me on the shoulder and said, today's the day that you're going to ask and find out. Question. Yeah. Yeah. So I asked and my mother didn't, didn't skip a beat. She immediately acknowledged it. And she, she said, yes, he did. And, you know, of course, everything imploded for both of us in that moment, Mm -hmm. because now we were both back together in the same place of grief that we hadn't been in for 35 years. And even though my mother had had all this time, decades to process it all, it's very different when you're now trying to protect your child all over again. Her yeah. greatest fear was what that knowledge would do to me. And it had did all the things you would expect. It blew me up. It absolutely blew me up. It shattered me from the inside out. And it took years. It took years for me to even be able to reconcile enough of it in my own mind to be able to tell my own kids. And I thought it was incredibly important as our daughters were teens and all the way back to the beginning of our conversation, we talked about those angsty teen years. They're so tough. There's so much going on. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to tell them what was in their DNA. They deserved to know they had the right to know Mm -hmm. because at any point in time, those, those, DNA parts can activate in you and it can change a lot. It can, it can flesh out mental illness that maybe you never thought was there. So I wanted our kids to understand what the history was and what the truth was. And as it happened, both of our daughters have struggled with um, some anxiety and depression. Our oldest um, struggled quite a bit with it. And it was because we had open conversations and because we talked about my history and my father's history that she felt safe and she felt like she could mm. let us in and be open and honest and and involve us in the solution which was therapy and medication and it's changed her life she's a different person she's worked so hard but she's a different person and it's beautiful just by the fact you being so willing to mm-hmm. have that conversation and not have that be part of the skeletons in your closet and never speak right. about it. Right. Want to go back to the fact that you were 10 and you believed your father had died of a heart attack. Just that alone would have been so important for you to understand a 10-year-old's feelings with their dad not being there for them and then to discover that it was a choice he had made what was the difference you mentioned it blew your world apart what was the difference in knowing that that created that for you Lisa you know when I was 10 years old you know, you've got such a limited capacity yeah, to really process something that big and, and do it in a way that you can internalize it. Um, you're really just kind of flying blind in a lot of ways. And I do have to say that while it was, it was the worst day, it was the very worst day. And to this day, it will always be my worst day. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, as much as it was such a traumatic loss, my father was my person. He was mm-hmm. my best friend in the world. And he was gone in in a blink. And the only way that I could reconcile with that is that it was beyond his control. I was told he had had a heart attack. So I understood that. Mm-hmm. That was something that I could identify with and connect with. And it made sense to me. And it was, you couldn't argue it. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was just an unfortunate situation. And I just felt for 35 years, I just felt so sad for him. I felt so sad that his life was cut so short and that he only had 18 years with my mother and that I didn't get to grow up with him. I mean, of course, like all the typical 
feelings of grief were there, but there was no why. I knew the why. His heart stopped working. It was beyond yeah. his control. That was the difference. When I found out 35 years later that he had taken his own life, the first feeling that I remember feeling was incredible anger. I was so angry. And the difference was when I was 10, I was angry at the situation. I was angry at God. I was angry at um, anything that I could be angry at because his heart stopped working. Yeah. When I found out that he had made the decision to leave, I was furious at only one person and that was at him because he left my mother in that situation. I was so protective. I, I have been to this day. I've always been so protective of my mom. Yeah. And it just, what really truly shattered me more than anything was not only that she had to raise me alone, had to all of a sudden become the breadwinner, become the mother, the father, the caregiver. Everything was in, in her care now whether she was whether she was capable of it or not and my mother is the most capable human being i've ever known in my life she's a superhero in every way but the fact that she had to do all of that by herself and the fact that she had to harbor that she chose to harbor that secret mm -hmm. alone you know all of a sudden it dawned on me that she had been hanging on to that secret for 35 years and my mother never talked about it with anyone, not a single soul. Wow. She never, she, she never went into therapy. She um, never spoke about it with a family member, nothing. She kept it to herself. And I just felt the weight of that so deeply that I was so great. It didn't take much time for me to become very grateful that I knew the truth for so many reasons. But one of the biggest reasons was that I could support my mother in the way that she had supported me. So you felt once you'd gotten over the anger at finding out the mm. truth around it, you could see that now I can support my mother because we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yes. Yes. It was. And it was, yeah, it was so cathartic for both of us mm -hmm. because for her, these were things that had lived inside her heart and her mind for decades. Yes. And there, you can only process those things to a point. Mm -hmm. It's a very different kind of processing when you're having a conversation with someone, when you can share these details with someone, when you can share what your emotional state was at that time, when you can cry to someone, when you can be hugged and held by someone. And and it made all the difference in the world. And And I'll tell you quite honestly, I think the reason why I was so angry with my father in the very beginning when I first learned is because my belief system, my own personal internal belief system around suicide was very different growing up. I felt, and no one gave me this perception. This was my own creation. I felt suicide was a very selfish act, which is a very, very common position for a lot of people. Yeah. Yep. And it was only after a, a couple of years, a few years, I think it was probably when I realized that our oldest was really experiencing her own mental illness and it was so beyond her control that it really just, everything clicked with me almost instantaneously that mental illness is just an illness. It's an illness that needs to be treated, that needs to be validated and that needs to be supported. Mm -hmm. And once I had that mind shift, everything changed. The anger that I felt was gone. Almost overnight, it was gone. So just having that mind shift, mindset shift yes. from that is so selfish. Um, I would imagine just the anger that you felt at the whole situation and the burden, the huge burden that was put on your mother. And as you said, you're very protective of her. Mm -hmm. That probably went a long, a lo long way for you to, to sort of fuel that uh, anger. It and did. 
when you had that shift in perception that mental illness is not selfish it is something that we need to help people with that was enough to unlock all this mm -hmm. all this pain and f unforgiveness of mm -hmm. your father mm -hmm. yeah i i found my way back to him i have always been someone who just i revered my father i just I adored him. I respected him. I admired him. He was my best friend in the world. And it, when I believed that, that he left us instead of staying and, and trying to, trying to get help, mm -hmm. it, I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't see beyond it for the longest time. Yeah. Until I realized that that illness was beyond his control. He couldn't, he couldn't control being ill. You would never fault someone for, for God forbid, being in a car accident and, and, you know, and getting paralyzed. You would never fault someone for having a cancer diagnosis or for dying of a heart attack. I mean, all of these things that yes. we don't second guess, never, who would ever second guess that? But we spend an awful lot of time second guessing our feelings about mental illness because it's so abstract. You can't see it. It's so abstract. It's so subjective. Mm -hmm. And you, you, but people don't realize how debilitating it is and how out of control the person can be who is afflicted with it. It is yeah. not in their control. And so for me, when I kind of had that revelation. And I, I, I can't tell you exactly when it was that I had it, but when I did have it, I mean, in the same way that hearing about a suicide blew me up, that really helped to put a lot of the pieces back together mm -hmm. because I stopped talking about, it. I had always talked about my father, pictures all over my house. I, I would talk about him with my kids in a way that he was always present. He was always a presence in their life. And I did that as much for them as I did for me to keep yeah. him active in their world. Yeah. I stopped talking about my father for almost three years. I mm -hmm. wouldn't look, couldn't look at a picture of him because of that anger. And yes. it all, it all changed overnight. And I found my way back to him and I feel closer to him now than I ever have actually. What a beautiful story. And when you think about when the, the sort of the climate around suicide, when your mom was experiencing it, you can understand why she chose to not be ridiculed or the judgment or any mm -hmm. of that brought the shame of it all being brought uh, to, to her house and, and, and to you as well. Mm -hmm. what, what strength. Yeah. My mother is a remarkable woman. Yeah. She, she really is. And she felt in that moment when he did pass away, she felt that I had enough to deal with knowing that my father was gone to mm -hmm. put a suicide on top of all that grief would have been my undoing. And I think she was right. I absolutely think she was right. Because if you think about it, I mean, my father died when we, you, we were just kind of moving from the 70s to the 80s it was 1978 there were no resources that no. were mainstream that were available i mean there were of course there was mental health counseling but there was nothing like what we have now there was no internet there was nothing at your fingertips there were no virtual groups there were no resources for children navigating suicide loss so she was very much on an island all by herself and the way that she felt she could manage was by was by changing the story mm. and um you know i'm grateful to her for that i really i really truly am as much as i was always a kid who felt like i i needed to always have information i i i was always questioning everything <laughs> she she knew in that moment what she could say to me mm -hmm. that would satisfy the situation that would not cause me to ever question anything. And, and I'm grateful for that because I can't imagine how different my life would have been if I had carried that along with me too.
until you were of an age where you would be able to have sort of worked through all the those emotions and put as mm -hmm. you say the pieces in a different uh, light different perspective and I'm it must have brought your mom and you a lot closer together her secret she could now share it she, it must have been very freeing for her as well it it was but not initially initially mm -hmm. she was very she was i don't want to say upset because that's not the right word that is it it doesn't have the right connotation she was sad she was very very sad for me overwhelmingly sad for me that I now had to regrieve my father's death for the second time in my life mm. from a very different perspective. And with the knowledge that he had taken his own life. Mm -hmm. And while I did come to understand that my father was in an incredible amount of pain, and that was the only thing that he felt that he could do to end that kind of pain and suffering. And I understand that now. It was a process to understand it. But my mother in the very beginning, um, she was she was distraught mm -hmm. because she had to watch me all go apart. through this all over. Yeah, all over again. And she was terribly worried, especially in the beginning, she was terribly worried about how it would impact the way that I felt about my father. And so I didn't, I mean, I've told her since in the years since, but in those first few years when I was so angry, I never told my mom the depth of the anger that I had toward my father. I mean, I talked about it with my husband and mm -hmm. um, I do a ton of journaling as a regular practice. So I would put it there. I had places to put it and I put it there and I didn't want to put it on her because I knew that it would have just made it agonizing for her to know to how see hard it was so much pain right 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 yeah. but um in the end the fact that we can not only talk to each other about it but that we're both talking to the world about it i have her featured regularly in my suicide survivor series videos yeah she's started talking about my dad's suicide publicly and mm -hmm with um with great love and affection and with a purpose in the same way that I do which is to have a positive impact on someone who may be thinking of doing the same thing and then maybe doesn't because yeah. they they find there's another way because they they've heard your story mm -hmm. totally. it must be so freeing for your mom to finally be able to share the love that she had for her husband. And mm -hmm. it, in in all of its messiness, this is who this is who he was. This is what we experienced as a family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's I think it's an incredible relief for her. It has been now for a number of years, especially mm -hmm. since I've been so public about it. And it's really changed the course of the work that I do. I'm in a completely different space content creation space than I've ever been in before. Uh, I was never in the mental health space before. And now this is really where I am and where I plan to stay. And because people need help, the the world, we're living in a crazy world right now, Anne. And it's we've moved from one pandemic to essentially another pandemic of mental illness. Yeah. And we need we need people out there setting the record straight. We need people out there being vulnerable, leading by example, and sharing our stories. You know, you don't share the full story. You can't fully help someone. It's as simple as that, right? Well, you're not authentic and people can right. sense that. Right. Yeah. Right. Sure. Right. Yeah. We have well, nothing to lose by being authentic. We have only to gain. Absolutely. And the thought that you can help and have helped somebody not do the same as your father did, choose mm -hmm. suicide. Lisa, what a story. And I will get your YouTube channel information uh, from you and we'll put it in the show notes so people who are listening to the audio, hopefully I will have it upon my YouTube channel. What work, work in progress. It's only been 10 years, but that's okay. That's okay. Better late than never. 
so that you can listen to it there, but also to hear more of what Lisa is sharing, um, because Lisa is a trained crisis counselor. She's lived it and has gone through the training and has helped so many, I can only imagine, in the year. Is that what you said? It's, it's been over a year now, yeah. It's, it's, year it's now. Approaching, approaching a year and a half that I've been on the crisis lines, yeah. Thank you from the bottom of my heart on behalf of all the parents whose lives of their children you may have ultimately touched without necessarily recognizing it, just by providing that safe space for them. Thank you, Lisa. It is my it is my pleasure to be able to do that. And it's been my pleasure to be able to be here with you. Thank you. Is there anything, any words of hope you'd like to leave our listeners with? I think I would tell people to just meet your feelings exactly where they are. I've been saying that a lot lately and it feels it feels like people need to hear it more now maybe than ever. If you're feeling if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling isolated, if you're feeling anxious, let yourself feel that. Let yeah. yourself feel it because to try and bury it or ignore it, you can't outrun it. So let yourself feel it and then let yourself be vulnerable. Let yourself ask for help. That's what we're all here together to support one another. So take advantage of that. Ask for help and and don't be afraid to to reach out because there are people out there who care very, very much about making sure you're okay. I love that. Don't be afraid to ask. Yeah, for sure. Thank you again, Lisa. I Enlightening conversation, a very necessary, a hard conversation. And I just feel so blessed and grateful that we are able to have a conversation such as this. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, as I say. You're so welcome. I, I appreciate you, Anne, and, and everything you're doing to help elevate this to a place where more people can be helped in, in ways that will be life-changing. Anyway, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now until our next episode drops. Thanks, Lisa. Bye-bye. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at anne at understandinggrief.com or you can visit my website at understandinggrief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now.